Thank you. And welcome back, everybody. Um, no, it's not easy. So I'm Dries, indeed. I'm from, uh, from Silverforce, running the EMEA business, actually, or you know, in Africa. Um, my session today is about authentication, authentication in a zero-trust world. Um, we're a young Israeli, by origin, uh, vendor as well. Um, we recently got a garden school vendor. That's why I put it up there. Um, anyone knows this document? Anyone has read it? Anybody from, from Deloitte, maybe? No, you know. It's a really good document. I like it. There's, there's a few of those out there, but this one is one that I really like. Um, this is a 2019 cybersecurity survey from Deloitte. came out earlier this year, obviously, and looking ahead of what, uh, what's coming. There's a lot of sections in there. Um, we are an identity and access management uh, vendor, so I immediately go to that section. And if we look at identity in the Deloitte cyber survey, this is one uh, part that I... Uh, that I took out, what are we looking at is what, what will people be doing, say, in the next six to 12 months from now? The document dates from Q1, but obviously still valid. Um, on the left, you see everything that has to do with privilege management. Right? Um, and if you do privilege management as projects, vendors, anybody involved in that? Some, at least one, two, two are, okay, good. That's, that's obviously a very critical, crucial part of identity and access management. We sit right next to it. So if you look at the, the next one, it says it's way too small to read, so let me zoom in a little bit. It talks about advanced multi-factor authentication and the way, this is what I like to call it, risk-based authentication, RBA. Silverfort is a RBA vendor. That is what we do. Risk-based authentication is basically the next generation, the next wave of multi-factor authentication. Any of you who do multi-factor already in some kind of a product? Come on, cool. Um, so we, we, we basically the next generation of that. Right? We, we build on top of existing multi-factor vendors. We also have our own solution. We'll talk about it. But we, we partner ma mainly with MSA vendors to basically go where they kind of stop going. Um, it's an equal amount of percentage. So if you look at all the budget being spent in 2019, say 2020, in the identity and access management, which is obviously in this um, new world of, of security becoming more and more important because everybody is going through this digital transformation. Well, 40% has to do with, on one hand, privilege management, on the other hand, next generation multi-factor and RBA. That's basically your first factor and your second factor for those of you who are a little bit technical in the, in the audience that represents. So it's, it's a huge one. The next one is smaller. 16% has to do with the migration to cloud and, and typically migration to Azure which is what we see, uh, what we see most. <laughs> so why, why is that? Why is it becoming so important? Well, obviously, we're sitting in this perimeter less screen now. So that's the section of the day we're now in. And if we look at where we all come from, all the, this is where we come from. This is the past network situation that we've been grown up with uh, for so long, where basically we have what we call, or like to call, untrusted users on the outside, connecting to, in most cases, VPN, VPN-style technology, maybe a Citrix, maybe both, connecting to the network and becoming trusted users, trusted insider. That's the principle we all used to work with for so long, um, having built huge walls around the network and, and assuming that we have uh, firewalls to keep the bad guys out. But we, we call that fast networks today. Right? That's where we all come from. What we're all going to, or where we basically already are, is this. The big wall is no longer there, or at least we punch small holes in that big wall to make sure that uh, we can set up federations to the cloud, that we can use cloud services, people use endpoint devices that now speak directly to the cloud. The data sits far away from our legacy and traditional network, so the whole world is changing. Welcome digital transformation, welcome increased cloud adoption. Everybody on the inside should be considered untrusted nowadays. That's not a negative thing, by the way. It's just the way we should deal with people. That is a little bit of a challenge with current authentication or authentication solutions out there. Right? We've built so long protecting that edge with the VPN, with a multi-factor on top of that, and we've built basically that system in the past using very intrusive technology. For those of you who know a little bit how traditional standard multi-factor works, it is a very intrusive technology. It means that you need to set up a service to speak with a multi-factor solution demanding the service to know how to do that. Otherwise, there is no MSA. If you want MSA coming out of your VPN, which everybody kind of does, 
of the VPN needs to know at least how to speak with the multi-factor solution. Otherwise, there's no, there's nothing coming out of that. That's the intrusiveness that we see in the past. Now, if the idea is to bring all of the mitigating controls that worked for us, that worked well on the setting meter, and we kind of inject them on the inside of our network going forward, because so the setting meter starts to say it's no longer, no longer there. But we need to find a way to do that. And, and those technologies that worked well in the past don't necessarily know how to work uh, well on the inside. I told you they're intrusive, so that means if we need to connect each and every service on the inside of our network with the multi-factor solution, that's going to be an end of it. Right? That means that we're going to have to reconfigure every service, and how do we do it for maybe those technologies that don't even support it? What do we do with file share? What do we do with... Um, legacy equipment, what do we do in operational technology environments where we're just not allowed to touch resources, and so on. So it's, it's an endless effort, it's a technical barrier, and it's also something we must do in a totally new way, because multi-factor is a very, let's say, simple mechanism. It's, it's a binary mechanism. The moment you turn it on, it's on for everybody. And that's fine. If you connect to a VPN, or you, you kind of expect every connection to be set up to result in a multi-factor challenge. If now we need that concept to be brought to the inside of a network, we can't really expect every session that everybody does to be launching multi-factor challenges because people would go great. We need to do it smart. We need to do it risk-based. Welcome risk-based education. That's what we do. Right? We are a solution that is built um, from the ground up in an agentless way. So we don't use proxies. We don't use agents. We don't use anything that really changes user behavior as it is today or the services that we protect. And we, we do that all to bring you to that zero trust security framework that everybody's transitioning. So how does that work? And it's a little bit a challenge for me to not become technical, so uh, I'll, I'll give it my best. But the principle is this. I'm a user, and from a silver fork perspective, it doesn't really make a difference which kind of user I am, whether that be an IT user, whether that be a business user, and maybe an operational technology user, factories, plants, uh, those kinds of things. It doesn't really matter which endpoint I'm using either. It's typically going to be Windows, could be a Mac, could be a Linux, could be a tablet, could be many of things. I'm going to be connecting once I'm on the network to a certain set of resources and services. Um, we don't want to change those either, so it doesn't really matter for us either where they sit, on premises and in the cloud. What's going on is whenever I connect to the network, I'm going to start authenticating to those services. I'm opening a file share. I'm going to a financial system. I'm going to a operating system, a Unix, a Windows, a Linux, and so on. So I'm, start, I'm starting to authenticate on the network. And in most cases, if not all today, I'm actually authenticating against an identity store, an identity provider, something central. In most cases, Active Directory and maybe a break to the cloud using Azure AD. That's what I do. I'm using my Dries account to connect to the network and basically use a multitude of services that are linked to my roles on the network. Now, this is what we typically would refer to as the first factor, and you would know it as a single sign-on where nobody asks you for a password, or an interactive logon where you would be receiving a pop-up that says, please give us your username and password. That's the first factor. Everybody has this. This is the field that we uh, normally start working with. So what does a normal multi-factor solution do? If you want to bring whatever service is important for the customer, and typically multi-factor sits in that space of VPNs and secrets and so on, we look at the service and now draw a line to the multi-factor saying, whenever this person connects, please raise a challenge, have him or her confirm the challenge and then authenticate. We don't do that. Because that means that those services need to know how to speak multi-factor, and we don't like that. So what we do is we basically listen to the network, we, have, we look at all the authentications that happen in the network, we inject a risk-based system um, where a typical multi-factor would be always on, we're actually dormant. In most cases we're dormant, we would just let those authentications pass, but based on our own calculations or on others, we partner with the likes of a checkpoint, a follow out or many more, we would say, well, in this case, we're going to step up because that person is coming from a strange place or the China office is um, it's normally closed, but I don't think they're open now. So there's many a reason why we could uh, inject an authentication. It could be that, um, well, this endpoint is now speaking to a certain website that is known to be a command and control center. Right? So we got reason to believe there's something going on here. Oh, 
that would come typically from a, from a firewall vendor. They would feed that into us, and at that moment, we would then reach out to a certain factor. Could be our, most likely will be somebody else's. Could be a, a duo, could be an RSA, could be an Oxfam, could be a Yugi. There's many a solution out there. When he or she then confirms authentic the authentication of the challenge, this comes back to us, and we go to the service and release that. What have we built here? We've built a completely agentless system for multi-factor or risk-based authentication, where us, which doesn't even require the services or the resources to know of our existence. We inject it on the network level. We don't inject it on the server. By doing so, and by listening on the network, and by reading out all the authentications that, that are currently ongoing, we see 20 to 50 times more than most other solutions on the market and, uh, and we work with them. So there's three ways, basically, for us to work with them. First of all, we, we learn everybody's behavior. Right? We have this engine that listens to each and everybody's authentication and network, and in most cases, we'll just say carry on. We are really a second opinion for the first time. That's basically what tool for this. Rather than the Active Directory allowing simple sessions to go on, they say, if you come to us and ask us to report, what do you think of this person trying to reach the service right now? We learn and we detect anomalies, lateral movement, people abusing privilege, um, credential theft, and so on. We also apply, obviously, known threats, known threats that we know, brute force attacks are very simple for us to detect, and so are some others, but also from, from that other side, right? We, we look at everything as authentication, and we speak together with all the other players to, uh, to get the external risk indications, the ones that I just mentioned, um, command and control center takeovers, and so on. We just had a bank who asked me, listen, um, we obviously have a vulnerability management system in place. If the vulnerability management system detects that a certain endpoint is of such an unpatched state um, that it's really critical for it to get patched, could you, for example, block all the authentications going to the Swift environment? Makes perfect sense. Active Directory would say it's a valid password to let it pass, but we may say just stop. If it's medium patched, we'll ask for a multi-factor. If it's unpatched or if it's too dangerous for the environment, regardless of the password being correct or incorrect, we'll just block it. I'm not going to allow it. This is what the dashboard looks like. I didn't, uh, we have a live demo, obviously, in, uh, at the booth, but I didn't bring a video. It's just some screenshots. So this is what the dashboard looks like. We'll inventorize whatever we see, and we see basically everything going on in the network, at least as far as authentications is concerned. We'll map it. And we'll, we'll also list it in, in, in terms of users, connected devices, services being used, and so on. So you can just zoom in and say, well, this intranet of ours, this internal website, who's been using it, and what are their risk profiles? We'll do that for humans, but also for service accounts. If you say, well, my problem fits, anybody's problem fits, actually, with service accounts. Windows service accounts, for example, that just connect from anywhere to anywhere, we'll, we'll map them all. We'll learn their behavior. Obviously, you can't ask a multi-factor for a service account, but you can micro-segment them, you can isolate them, you can block them if they start doing uh, abnormal stuff. So we do that as well. What do we more? Well, the key use cases of a tool for the environment are typically cloud migration. We are an enabler, and security should be an enabler, by the way. So we are an enabler for uh, cloud migration. So whether that means putting multi-factor first on an on-premise solution and then allowing the migration to the cloud, and by the way, multi-factor is a reluctant um, thing for, for people going to the cloud, because you're basically putting your data somewhere else. Or whether that means just putting it straight on the cloud. We do a lot of Office 365 as well. Office 365 is, is making the demand for a multi-factor increase um, much more than we ever saw. So uh, both will work. Um, we also typically what we call protect the unprotectable. A lot of our customers say, I have RSA, I have Oxfam. Okay, it's a typical cloud product. I would like to use it for my Linux SSH authentications, or I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working with a legal company and their most important data sits on file share. Can we put multi-factor on file share? Whether that means command line mounting of a drive or actual clicking on a, on a drive in, a, in my Windows Explorer. So we can extend the current multi-factor solution to those places. We can fully implement AI-driven risk-based authentication. That's across the board, where we start working with each and every user, learn behavior, speak to other parties, and step up authentication when needed. We typically are involved in anything that has to do with privilege management. Um, I told you in the beginning, 19% goes 
this year, at least 19% goes to BAM solar projects, which is not us. Another 19% goes to advanced MFA and risk based authentication. That's us. These two sit together for a reason. Right? So we partner with the likes of a Cyberarch and more in order to, to establish those projects. We would play in machine to machine access environments, right? where people say, I see all of these queries coming from traditional legacy environments on my uh, domain control, and I have no idea why they're there. We would go and figure it out, because we will see them and we will learn them and we will find out why they're there. And, most of all, and, and in, some, in some cases, mostly uh, important as well, we will monitor and visualize everything and build a report for you. Right? So we do have customers that say, we like the risk-based authentication part, we like the multi-factor kind of next-gen approach, but what we need most right now is a visualization of anything that goes on in our network. Because we, we know where the problem is, but we have no, no way to visualize it or to even learn and, uh, and, and, and share that with, uh, with the other people. And that's it. That's for uh, the Thank you.